Welcome to CBS News Primetime. I'm John Dickerson. Brittany Griner is breathing free air. Thursday morning, we learned the WNBA star had been released from Russia and was already on her roughly 9,000-mile journey from corrective penal colony number two, Mordovia, to her home in Houston, Texas, where the town lights will be lit red, white, and blue. But American Paul Whelan still sleeps under the lights of a Russian prison cell as his exhausted family tries to find hope for an end to his captivity. Four years as collateral in the clash between nations in a dangerous world that the House of Representatives voted to police with the largest defense spending bill ever, while also voting to secure the liberty of marriage for same-sex couples. But first, WNBA star and Olympic gold medalist Brittany Griner has been released from a Russian prison. CBS News was the first to report the 32-year-old's 30, freedom was brokered in a one-on-for-one -on -one prison sw prisoner swap for convicted Russian arms dealer Victor Boot. But one person notably missing from the deal is former U.S. Marine Paul Whelan. He has been in Russian custody for over four years on espionage charges. President Biden says he will never give up on securing Whelan's release. CBS News Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent Margaret Brennan reports. I'm glad to be able to say that Brittany's in good spirits. She, uh, she's relieved to finally be heading home. Gathered in the Oval Office, President Biden and Brittany Griner's wife, Sherelle, spoke by phone with the 32-year-old basketball star once she had been handed over. Today, I'm just standing here um, overwhelmed with emotions. Russian state media showed video of the swap on the tarmac at Albatine Airport in Abu Dhabi. Griner and convicted arms dealer Victor Boot walked towards one another and then headed to separate planes home. In Russian video filmed days earlier, Griner is seen signing what appears to be release forms. Do you know where I'm heading to? No. No? No. 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 You fly back home? To, to the U.S. To the U.S. Oh, okay. President Biden agreed last week to free Boot in order to bring Griner home. It follows months of public pressure from Griner's fellow athletes and quiet contact between the CIA and Russian intelligence, who exchanged messages between Vladimir Putin's Kremlin and Mr. Biden. Throughout the summer, the Biden administration had tried to bring home both Griner and 52-year-old Paul Whelan, a private corporate security contractor who had been imprisoned for four years on espionage charges. But Russia refused. I wish that um, Paul Whelan had been on that, that, that plane, too. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. We got to the point where it was clear that there was an opportunity to bring Brittany, Brittany back. The choice wasn't between getting one American or the other back. It was the choice before us was one or none. Whelan was also left behind in April when the Biden administration negotiated the release of Marine veteran Trevor Reed. Today, a death penal colony number two, Mordovia, to her home in Houston, Texas, where the town lights will be lit red, white, and blue. But American Paul Whelan still sleeps under the lights of a Russian prison cell as his exhausted family tries to find hope for an end to his captivity. Four years as collateral in the clash between nations in a dangerous world that the House of Representatives voted to police with the largest defense spending bill ever while also voting to secure the liberty of marriage for same-sex couples. But first, WNBA star and Olympic gold medalist Brittany Griner has been released from a Russian prison. CBS News was the first to report the 32-year-old's freedom was brokered in a one-on-one -on -one prisoner swap for convicted Russian arms dealer Victor Boot. But one person notably missing from the deal is former U.S. Marine Paul Whelan. He has been in Russian custody for over four years on espionage charges. President Biden says he will never give up on securing Whelan's release. CBS News Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent Margaret Brennan reports. I'm glad to be able to say that Brittany's in good spirits. She, uh, she's relieved to finally be heading home. Gathered in the Oval Office, President Biden and Brittany Griner's wife, Sherelle, spoke by phone with the 32-year-old basketball star once she had been handed over. Today, I'm just standing here um, overwhelmed with emotions. Russian state media showed video of the swap on the tarmac at Albatine Airport in Abu Dhabi. 
Griner and convicted arms dealer Victor Boot walked towards one another and then headed to separate planes home. In Russian video filmed days earlier, Griner is seen signing what appears to be release forms. Do you know where I'm heading to? No. No? No. no. You fly back home to, to the U.S. To the U.S. Okay. Okay. President Biden agreed last week to free boot in order to bring Griner home. It follows months of public pressure from Griner's fellow athletes and quiet contact between the CIA and Russian intelligence, who exchanged messages between Vladimir Putin's Kremlin and Mr. Biden. Throughout the summer, the Biden administration had tried to bring home both Griner and 52-year-old Paul Whelan, a private corporate security contractor who had been imprisoned for four years on espionage charges. But Russia refused. I wish that um, Paul Whelan had been on that, that, that plane, too. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. We got to the point where it was clear that there was an opportunity to bring Brittany, Brittany back. The choice wasn't between getting one American or the other back. It was the choice before us was one or none. Whelan was also left behind in April when the Biden administration negotiated the release of Marine veteran Trevor Reed. Today, a devastated Whelan spoke by phone from a Russian penal colony. My treatment is also much different than um, others held for espionage at other prisons. Meanwhile, Griner is en route to Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio, where she will get an evaluation. Today, my family is whole, but as you all are aware, there are so many other families who are not whole. Secretary Blinken told me that this one-for-one -one swap was just a single transaction, nothing more and nothing less. In other words, this wasn't a diplomatic breakthrough that opens the door to other opportunities. It also isn't clear what card the U.S. can play next that would persuade Vladimir Putin to release Paul Whelan or at least one other American, Mark Fogel, who's being held on drug charges. The U.S. had offered a number of other Russian prisoners being held in the U.S., to the Kremlin as potential trades, but Russia insisted on one for one. Victor Boot was their priority. Margaret Brennan, CBS News, Washington. For more on this, let's bring in CBS News Chief National Affairs and Justice Correspondent Jeff Pegues. Jeff, let's start with another clip from Margaret Brennan's exclusive interview with Secretary of State Antony Blinken, and it's about his reaction to the release of convicted arms dealer Victor Boot. Victor Boot's been off the playing field uh, since 2008, uh, which is a very good thing. Uh, and he served uh, about half of his sentence. At some point uh, in the years to come, he was going to get out. And I'm glad at least that we were able to, um, to get Brittany Griner home. Well, some Pentagon officials are worried that Boot is back on the playing field. What is their concern, Jeff? Well, their concern is that he's going to get Back in this game of selling arms, as you know, Johnny had this nickname, Merchant of Death, because of the amount of arms that he was selling. He had his own fleet of planes, according to people that we've talked to. And so this is someone who law enforcement wanted off the playing field, if you will, and, and there is concern among some uh, sectors that he might go back to what he used to do. But there are also people that we've talked to who say he's not the same guy that he was. And, Jeff, what about um, y y y there is the argument that in prisoner swaps, it basically creates a market for the Russians to just take another American and use, you know, use it for leverage for whatever other thing they want. What are the threats for Americans who are traveling to places like Russia? Well, you know, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that that is not the case. If you have this kind of swap, there is the potential there that it makes Americans in certain countries more of a target. But if you're the Biden administration and you're, you're weighing the optics of Brittany Griner not being home after a year, which it would have been uh, after the new year, versus giving up Victor Boot, who some officials believe is not the same merchant of death that he used to be versus Brittany Griner coming home, you know, the optics are better for what we saw today. And so you have to weigh these issues. These are very yeah. complicated negotiations, as you know, John. And, and I think in this case, the Biden opportunity saw 
uh, saw a, a point where they could make this deal and get Brittany Griner back, still work on securing Paul Whelan's yeah. release. But the fact of the matter is, you know, these are complicated issues. And what, what do you think, Jeff, it says about, I mean, on the one hand, the U.S. is basically doing everything it can to, uh, to help Ukraine in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And on the other hand, there's at least enough of a relationship that this could be worked out. What does this say, if anything, about the relationship between the, the fact that this deal was worked? Uh, what does it say, if anything, about the U.S. relations with Russia? Well, there's the U.S. relations with Russia. They're... You know, I think everybody in the foreign policy establishment here would say that they're at a low point. I mean, you, you have this stalemate, essentially, in Ukraine, and you have swaps like this because, you know, this is one of the few negotiating tools that Russia has with the West at this time, which also feeds into this argument that, hey, we should not have made this deal. But the fact of the matter is the Russians have very little negotiating power right now, whether it's Ukraine or on some of these other issues. And they're going to use whatever advantage they have. And in this case, they had an advantage, mm. uh, because this was obviously a deal that the U.S. and the Biden administration specifically wanted to make. Right. All right, Jeff Pegues in Washington. Thanks so much, Jeff. The House on Thursday approved legislation that provides federal protections for same-sex and interracial marriages. The Respect for Marriage Act passed 258 to 169. Every Democrat voted in favor of the bill, along with 39 Republicans. Outgoing House Speaker Nancy Pelosi celebrated the bill earlier. This legislation honors that match, protecting it from bigoted extremism, defending the inviolability of the same sex and interracial marriages. The Respect for Marriage Act takes key steps to uphold marriage equality under federal law. This is what we're celebrating. Tearing down the defense of marriage off, taking off the books for good. Enshrining married couples right to equal protection. Requiring that every the legislation passed in the Senate last week with bipartisan support. 61 yes votes. Democrats were joined by 12 Republicans. It now goes to President Biden's desk for his signature. The House also passed an $858 billion defense bill in a bipartisan vote. It includes a repeal of a COVID vaccine mandate for U.S. troops. Republican lawmakers had pushed for that against the wishes of the Pentagon and the White House. The historically large defense bill also includes a 4.6% raise for service members and money to support Taiwan and Ukraine. It also strips commanders of the power to put their fingers on the scale in sexual assault cases, a change long pushed for by advocates. The bill now heads to the Senate for a vote. Gas prices are down significantly from their record highs in June. According to AAA, the, pri the average price, average is a key word, for a gallon of regular was $3.33 Thursday. It was $3.34 the same day in 2021. Chris Van Cleve checks in on the economy. How low will they go? Plummeting pump prices below $3 at this Atlanta area gas station Thursday. How much are you saving with gas prices down? Oh, I, I said pretty penny. Pretty good penny. After reaching an all-time high of $5.02 this summer, the average cost of a gallon of gas across the country is down nearly 35% and is cheaper than it was a year ago. Where do you think they settle? Well, I, I think below $3 could be the floor. Conceivably, if everything goes well, the national average could drop under $3 and spend time in the upper twos. While plunging gas prices have given Americans some relief, they are still facing stubbornly high inflation, up 7.7% over the last year. Prices for groceries, rent, and household energy all remain high. The Federal Reserve has raised interest rates six times this year, trying to slow spending and tame soaring prices. Yeah. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen told CBS Evening News anchor Nora O'Donnell for Sunday's 60 Minutes, the battle to curb inflation isn't over yet. What is 2023 going to look like for the average consumer? So I believe inflation will be lower. Um, I am very hopeful that the labor market will uh, remain quite healthy uh, so that people can feel good about their finances and their personal economic situation. 
Gas Buddy estimates the average American right now is saving about $80 a month compared to what they were paying at the pump at the peak this summer. If gas prices hit $3 a gallon, those savings will be closer to $100 a month. John? Chris Van Cleve, thank you. You can watch more of Nora's interview with Secretary Yellen on 60 Minutes. It airs this Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern and streams here Tuesday at 8. In other Treasury news, Janet Yellen is right on the money. Thursday, the Treasury Secretary unveiled the first U.S. currency to bear her signature. I am truly honored that, thanks to the hard work of this team, the first banknotes with my signature are being delivered this month to the Federal Reserve, and they'll be in circulation starting in the new year. Yellen is the first female Treasury Secretary on U.S. currency, and her name will appear alongside that of U.S. Treasurer Lynn Malerba, the first Native American in that role. It will be the first time that both of the signatures on U.S. bills will belong to women. There are renewed concerns about the safety of U.S. power grids after attacks in North Carolina. Coming up, I'll speak with one expert about what can be done to safeguard the nation's critical infrastructure. Plus, we'll show you the scathing congressional report about an NFL team and its owner. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. Washington Commander's owner Dan Snyder is accused of creating a culture of fear in a new report from the House Oversight Committee. The report found that the commanders perpetrated a toxic work culture for more than two decades. They're also accused of downplaying sexual misconduct by men at top levels of the organization. Snyder himself allegedly touched staffers inappropriately. He is also accused of interfering with a separate investigation into sexual harassment by team executives. Everyone who lost power over the weekend in North Carolina when two substations were attacked now have the lights back on. Gunfire damaged the facilities. More than 45,000 Duke Energy customers were in the dark, and schools were closed all week in Moore County. Officials say the substations were intentionally targeted, and the FBI is assisting in the investigation. The FBI is also investigating a separate incident in South Carolina. Authorities say... And, you know, uh, and there are some efforts already taking place as we see increase in uh, weather events and also cyber events. So I would say that, you know, first thing is reinforcing critical substation. And, and we need to identify those, which critical assets those are. Second thing, we need to put more sensors and real-time monitoring so that we can send alerts to operators, to police, and, uh, and everyone who need to respond to these kind of events. Third, which is most important, is we need to change our thinking, which were initially reliability driven to resilience driven design, training, planning, and operation. And, and there's a lot in, in this, you know, in this statement, because the way we operate and plan our grid right now is all focused on keep supplying the power grid, assuming that few things will fail. It does not take care of these kind of extreme events. And it used to be rare. And Anurag, let me just interrupt for a moment. Is it also, in addition to making them more resilient, is it also the case that these electric facilities or these uh, are done on a state by state basis? There's no uniform um, uh, regime for hardening these targets. I would say yes. Yeah. So most. Uh, of these investment to to make it, you know, more monitored and more reinforced, is driven by each utility, and it might be multiple state by uh, you know one electric grid operators, and as they go for upgrading these facilities, uh, they you know most in most of the cases they need to go to regulators and ask to increase the you know approve this cost so that they can get the bill paid by ratepayers. So it is, it, is, it is a little bit different by state by state, uh, by grid operators. And, and finally, the 
the most recent infrastructure bill had some money that went towards upgrading the national power grid. How much, um, how important and, and helpful will that be? This will definitely help. I mean, we are talking about uh, biggest man-made machine ever, I mean, the electric grid. Uh, just talking about substation, which uh, had this uh, attack, you know, there are like 55,000 substations. So even with $65 billion of infrastructure bill going towards the grid, it's not enough to, you know, to make the complete grid very, very resilient. But it will definitely you know, help us uh, in making some of those uh, critical substation and uh, and community more resilient to these kind of extreme events. All right. Anurag Srivastava, thank you so much for being with us. Anchorage, Alaska saw a record amount of snowfall this week. More than a foot of snow was recorded Wednesday. That's the most ever in a single storm in more than two decades. Many schools in the area had to be closed Thursday. The National Weather Service is telling people to drive carefully as the roads remain hazardous. We're tracking some snowfall in the north, west, and the northern plains. Meteorologist Chris Bruin with our partners at the Weather Channel has the latest. A couple of smaller rounds of snow to end out the weekend, head into the weekend, and then a much bigger, more impactful storm as we head through early next week that will cross the country. So a lot to get to. We don't want to let our guard down with some of the snow we may see here for the upper Midwest, especially northern Iowa, southern Minnesota, and the Great Lakes, expecting at least a few inches. Some areas may see over a half foot of snow. Also some snow in interior sections of the northeast. The west, meanwhile, starting to get active and really ramps up this week. And we're talking feet of snow for the Sierra, the Wasatch, the Tetons, and the Cascades. That energy then, by Sunday into Monday, will eject out into the plains and create likely our second blizzard of the year, especially here for the northern tier, a very expansive blizzard with feet of snow for the plains, as well as a severe side and heavy rain in between the two. So a lot to cover here. Of course, we'll keep you posted on the Weather Channel. Be sure to watch the Weather Channel on cable and now streaming live on your favorite TV streaming device. Chris Bruin, thank you. What's next for Marine veteran Paul Whelan in Russia? I'll speak with the family attorney about his case and efforts to bring him back to American soil. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. Welcome back to CBS News Primetime. I'm John Dickerson. Here's a look at our top stories. A, measuring protecting, a measure protecting same-sex and interracial marriages has passed in the House. The Respect for Marriage Act received bipartisan support with 39 Republicans joining Democrats in voting yes. Basketball star Brittany Griner is returning to the U.S. after being released from a Russian prison. In exchange, Russia received notorious arms dealer Victor Boot. But not included in that deal was Paul Whelan. The Marine veteran is serving 16 years prison sentence on espionage charges. President Biden says the U.S. will continue to negotiate for his release. For more, I'm joined by Whelan family attorney Ryan Fahey. Ryan, I want to play some, uh, some of Paul's interview with CNN on Thursday morning. They've always considered me to be at a higher level um, than other criminals um, of my sort. And um, for whatever reason, uh, I'm treated differently than another um, individual here from a Western country that's also on a charge of espionage. So even though we're both here for espionage, um, I'm treated much differently than he is. And my treatment is also much different than um, others held for espionage at other prisons. So can you share any more details about how Paul's currently doing? Well, John, thanks first uh, for, for having me and, and allowing me to speak on behalf of the, the Whelan family, which uh, has inspired me now for four years with their strength and resilience, um, and, and, and Paul's done the same. Um, you know, Paul is, uh, appears to be doing as, as well as can be expected after, after four years of this. Um, obviously, he's, he's sorely disappointed uh, by this result. Um, this is the second time. Um, very um, gratefully, uh, Americans have come home, uh, but but he has again been been left behind. Um, the family is gratified, of course, as I know Paul is for Brittany Griner's release. Um, we've been in touch with 
uh, the Griner team, all of which uh, fought hard for her release. But uh, the family's filled with a variety of complex emotions, um, and um, everyone can be can be assured that they're going to continue fighting for Paul, and that Paul's going to continue to fight to have his his voice heard. Secretary Blinken said the choice was one or none. Um, do you take the secretary and the administration uh, at their word that they had no leverage in in trying to get Paul home? I, I do. The administration um, this time around did a did a fabulous job, really managing the family's expectations. Um, a senior a State Department official visited Paul's sister Elizabeth uh, yesterday to inform her of the news, to allow them to process this. Um, a, a senior White House official was permitted to call Paul uh, and inform him uh, of all the steps being taken. And I know today that Secretary Blinken uh, and the president himself um, have been in touch with the family. And uh, obviously it's shared disappointment, uh, but it's also, I think, shared resolve. And uh, the family very much believes the, the, the administration is doing everything they can uh, and the only silver lining here, other than Brittany's release, is that they'll be able to focus 100% of their time uh, on getting Paul's release. Paul's brother, William, said it's clear that the U.S. government has no concessions that the Russian government will take for Paul Whelan. And so Paul will remain a prisoner until that changes. Essentially, there's, there's no one left to trade of Paul's significance. And that um, seemed to suggest that there are no uh, options. How do you how do you see it? Well, look, the, the Russian agenda has always been to sow chaos uh, in America, at least um, over the course of the past several years. Um, and that's um, this is another instance of that, really. There, there seems to be a desire, and this is what the president mentioned this morning in his statement, uh, to, to, to seek uh, the equivalency for Paul. He's accused of espionage. Of course, it's uh, entirely fabricated, as, as has been demonstrated uh, over the course of all the facts that have come out over the past several years. But um, it's difficult to understand what the Russians want exactly, whether that's uh, an exchange uh, of someone who on our side has been accused and convicted of espionage, whether it's uh, some other equity in the intelligence community, it's difficult to know. And so the truth of the matter is we don't really know, nor does the administration, what the Russians want. Um, all we can hope for is that there'll be continued engagement on Paul's case. And I miss, uh, misspoke there. Um, uh, Paul's brother's name is David. Um, Ryan, can you help me understand um, from a human standpoint here what the family, um, what it's been like? I mean, obviously there is this specific instance, but um, how hard it must be to wake up every day trying to do something and have... Um, have it be so frustrating. What What is that experience like and how are they holding up? So this, this is um, one of the, the most inspiring families I've ever met. They're exceptionally smart, um, thoughtful. Um, I, I volunteered to help them because uh, I knew Washington DC very, very well, having served at the Justice Department in a national security role. And uh, they've overcome me in, in, in a number of different ways by their, uh, their resilience, as I say. Um, but this is another day uh, after four years of having to wake up uh, and continue to fight for their brother. To um, th There's been a lot of progress, of course, over those four years and, and um, the capacity of the United States government to handle these issues has improved considerably since we started on this in late 2018. But of course, this is a family who's faced a totally unpredictable four-year crisis. Um, Paul has elderly parents who have missed him now, uh, another Christmas very likely uh, after four years of custody. And their nightmare continues. Um, but but again, I think they've shown their resilience and I think you know they're in close contact with the administration. And that's all a family in this situation can ask for is to be assured that the administration is doing everything they can uh, in order to secure Paul's release. All right, Ryan Fahey, thank you so much for coming on and uh, sharing their views with us. Thank you. Nice to be with you. Thanks. Peru's democracy faced a constitutional crisis on Wednesday when their president, Pedro Castillo, tried to dissolve Congress before he could be impeached for corruption.
He failed after his cabinet and military refused to follow his lead. Castillo was ousted, arrested, and on Thursday, he appeared in court on rebellion charges. Castillo is a former farmer and union leader. He ran on reducing poverty, but he now joins a long list of Peruvian presidents who have been charged with corruption in recent decades. Meanwhile, Castillo's former vice president, Dina Bolarte, became the first female leader of the republic. She was sworn in Wednesday, just, after, just three hours after Castillo attempted to, to dissolve the Congress. She says she wants to, quote, reorient the country. Google must delete search results about people in Europe if those people can prove the information is wrong. That's what the European Union's highest court ruled Thursday. The case stems from a complaint in Germany in which two men claimed search results based on their names linked back to articles with false claims. Google says it has welcomed the court's decision. There are approximately 400,000 children in foster care. A program in California is giving students in the system the resources and support they need to prepare for higher education. Mark Strassman takes a closer look. At 17, senior Julie Penafort could be just another kid bouncing around California's foster care system. Instead, she's found hope with help. They're like family to me, so it's like I look up to them a lot, and they've made a big impact in my life. They are First Star Academy at UCLA. This privately funded national program on 15 college campuses recruits, practically rescues, foster care kids when they're high school freshmen. It teaches them life skills and you could say improbably pulls college dreams out of a black trash bag. So a lot of foster youth know what the black um, trash bag means. Sometimes they only get a couple minutes to pack everything that they have in this room and take it to the next placement. When a caseworker shows up with a black trash bag, they know it means it's time to go again. Yes. Sometimes they don't get an alert. Nationally, roughly half of foster kids graduate high school. 10% go to college. But First Star seniors, 97% graduate high school. Roughly two out of three enroll in four-year colleges. What is it your program is doing right? We are providing them positive adult role model that is going to be with them for four years. Consistency. is the key word. I just think childhood experiences, you're taught to you know, keep your head down, be quiet, to stay out of trouble and not get yelled at. Isael Andrade is Julie's mentor. Now 23, this former foster kid went to seven different middle schools. I went to the same stuff that Julie did. You know, our stories are very similar. Once a month for four years, they've met in person, but they're constantly talking, making sure she's on track. It's like, I see him as a brother. What's the biggest thing he's taught you? I think how to stand up for myself. <laughs> would you at 13 recognize you at 17? No, I would not. Julie's applying to college now. Whatever she does, I'm going to be proud of her. Her first choice, UCLA. For Eye on America, Mark Strassman in Los Angeles. Still to come, COVID vaccines and drugs to treat the virus could soon cost Americans. We'll explain. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. The wife of a U.S. diplomat received a suspended prison sentence Thursday for a car crash that killed a British teenager. Anne Sekoulis admitted fault in the 2019 crash. Harry Dunn was killed when his motorcycle collided with a car in eastern England. Sekoulis was driving on the wrong side of the road at the time. On Thursday, Dunn's mother said justice had been served. Job done. Promise complete. Properly, properly complete now. You know, Anne Sekoulis has a criminal record for the rest of her life. Um, that was something that, you know, they never, she never thought she'd see, the US government never thought that they'd see. And we've worked tirelessly and relentlessly to make sure that she, in the end, still had to do what you and I would have had to have done. So, yeah, Harry, we've done it. And wicked, <laughs> wicked. The suspended prison sentence means Sekoulis will only serve time if she commits another offense in the UK. The U.S. government has spent more than $25 billion on Pfizer and Moderna COVID-19 vaccines. According to a new analysis by Kaiser 
health news, the federal government has so far purchased over 1.2 billion doses. That's an average price of nearly $21 per dose. These vaccines have been provided free of charge to people across the nation, but that could soon change. That's because the Biden administration could stop paying for COVID-19 treatments. That includes Paxlovid, a drug that has been that has proved effective at keeping patients out of the hospital. Joining us now is Dr. Celine Gounder. She is an editor at large for public health at Kaiser Health News. She is also an infectious disease specialist and epidemiologist and a CBS News medical contributor. So, Dr. Gounder, what um, how much are we talking about if if in cost? if these are no longer, uh, both the vaccines and Paxlovid, or if, they, if they're no longer free to people? Paxlovid was purchased by the federal government for over $500 a course. Those numbers will certainly multiply by several fold for the average person who's having to pay out of pocket. Uh, we know that insurance companies will cover at least some of the cost of this for some people, but people who do not have insurance could be facing not only the cost of Paxlovid, but then the cost of the doctor's appointment to even get the prescription. Right. And so if, if we're most worried about uh, older Americans, what, how, what would the relationship between Paxlovid and Medicare be? Would that be covered? Well, this is a real issue of timing. So right now, as long as the public health emergency remains in place, mm -hmm. Medicare would cover Paxlovid once it became um, something that would be not provided for free by the federal government. But once that public health emergency comes to an end, if Paxlovid is still not fully approved by the FDA, if it's still under this emergency use authorization, then Medicare won't cover it. And so we could find ourselves in this window where Medicare does not cover Paxlovid. The people who most need it, most need it, the elderly, could find themselves not able to afford it. And, and also there's a CDC study that said black and Hispanic patients with COVID were much less likely to get Paxlovid um, than white patients. So presumably uh, if this commercialization of the drug would, would hit those communities even harder be even harder because already they're having difficulty accessing because you need a prescription. So you have um, access to care issues. And then on top of that, now you have to actually pay for the drug potentially. And we know that there are higher rates of uninsurance, not having insurance among black and Hispanic communities. So we will see widening disparities in access to Paxlovid. So we've been talking now about the treatment. Once you get it, let's talk about the vac the vaccine. So uh, hopefully you don't get it at all. Um, first of all, on the cost question, um, if the administration is no, if you're no longer getting them for free, what would a what would a jab cost you? Right now, they cost about twenty dollars a dose to the administration. We're looking at seeing that cost go up three to four times. So maybe a hundred dollars a dose for the vaccine. And again, on top of that, you have things like the doctor's appointment fee, a vaccine administration fee. So it's quite a lot more than what people are looking at now, which is free. Right. So then the public health question. Let's imagine there's a new variant, as there undoubtedly will be, right? And the mRNA vaccines are tweaked to fix that new variant. Okay, everybody's go, got, got to go get a new booster. If they cost, how uh, problematic will that be in terms of trying to get enough people covered so that we don't have a bunch of people walking around with COVID? Well, even right now, only about a third of seniors, and that's the group that is highest risk for complications at this stage in the pandemic, only a third have gotten the updated bivalent booster. And so if you're adding on top of that additional out-of-pocket costs, you know, even if somebody has insurance that covers some of this, you're still going to probably face some out-of-pocket costs. And so we will see fewer people accessing vaccines as well as treatment. And so for the vulnerable communities, that means they won't be protected. But then also, is there a challenge or a problem if you just have a lot of COVID in the community that has its own uh, problems and challenges in terms of mutations and that kind of thing, right? Right, because you're going to see with less vaccination, you will see more transmission. Uh, the vaccines are not perfect in preventing transmission, but they do take a big dent out of that. And then on top of that, if you have people who are getting infected who can't access treatment, more of them will end up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. More crowded hospitals means not just, you know, trouble for COVID patients, but really for everybody who's in the hospital. Right. That familiar cycle. All right, doctor, thank you so much for being with us as always. The FAA is facing criticism for airline seat safety testing that doesn't take into account people with disabilities. Chris Van Cleve spoke to one Democratic lawmaker who's pushing the agency to change its process. In a simulated cabin that can be filled with smoke and plunged into darkness, 
the FAA tested the safe size of airline seats and how passengers can get out in 90 seconds or less. While the volunteer passengers in the simulated evacuations had varying seat sizes, they did not have to deal with real-life obstacles like smoke, the dark, or even luggage. And they were in groups of 60, nowhere near a full plane load. In 2019, the FAA explained... And we're going to try to minimize the variables to the ones that are important for this particular test. Airplane seat width is already down as much as 4 inches over the last 30 years to as little as 16 inches wide. And seat pitch, the distance between rows, has shrunk from about 35 inches to 31, and in some cases, as little as 28 inches, allowing airlines to add more seats. The FAA found seat size and spacing did not adversely affect the success of emergency evacuations. But because all participants were able-bodied adults under 60, then FAA Administrator Steve Dixon acknowledged the results are useful, but not necessarily definitive. Miracle on the Hudson pilot, Captain Sully Sullenberger. On our flight, it took over three minutes to evacuate everyone, partly because the airplane was filling up rapidly with water from back to front, but also because it was real life and we had a full aircraft. Six Democratic senators recently urged the FAA to reconsider its findings, saying not accurately reflecting the flying public is one of its most glaring flaws. Do you think you could get off an airplane in 90 seconds? Not in the normal conditions that I, that I normally travel in. Senator Tammy Duckworth, who lost both legs while serving in Iraq, is now proposing legislation requiring a new FAA seat size study looking at how real-life conditions, including children, seniors, and the disabled, as well as the presence of carry-on bags, impacts evacuation times. When you're testing with uh, uh, not real-world conditions, then that gets me worried. Airlines are traveling now with just about every seat filled. You can't just practice evacuating an aircraft that is only 30% full because that's not the way commercial aviation looks today. The FAA says it is going through more than 26,000 public comments about airline seats, but it followed guidelines and its testing laid out by Congress. The airlines say safety is their top priority and they will continue to work with the FAA. Chris Van Cleve, CBS News, Reagan National Airport, Virginia. Brittany Griner's exchange is the latest in a complex history of prisoner swaps between the United States and Russia. The first exchange in 1962 took place in the heart of the Cold War when the U.S. released KGB spy Rudolf Abel in exchange for American student Frederick Pryor and Air Force pilot Captain Francis Gary Powers, who'd been shot down flying a U-2 spy plane over the Soviet Union. That dramatic exchange over the Gleinecke Bridge in Germany was the center of Steven Spielberg's movie, The Bridge of Spies. The bridge was again in use in 1985. The U.S. and Soviet Union had their largest swap of the era. Four spies held by the U.S. in exchange for 25 dissidents in Soviet custody. That swap included the famed Polish spy Marian Zakarski, who stole military secrets from the U.S. In 2010, the U.S. traded 10 Russian spies in exchange for Russians who had been imprisoned for illegal contact with the West. These 10 Russians living in the States later became the inspiration for the hit show The Americans. The members of the spy ring bought homes and raised their children in the suburbs while gathering intelligence for the Russian government. Finally, earlier this year, U.S. Marine veteran Trevor Reed was exchanged for a convicted Russian drug trafficker. Reed had been sentenced in 2020 to a nine-year term, but his health had deteriorated, which prompted the Biden administration to increase talks of a trade. We're going to take a quick break. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. The first three episodes of Harry and Meghan have been released on Netflix. The six-part docu-series will explore the relationship between the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, as well as their estrangement from the royal family. 
Charlie Daggett has more from London. This is a great love story. And the craziest thing is that I think this love story is only just getting started. But the touching love story of a couple seeking happiness soon turned to more serious subjects. Allegations of racism. Eight days after the relationship became public, I put out a statement calling out the racist undertones of articles and headlines that were written by the British press, as well as outright racism um, from those articles across uh, social media. The media pressure only worsened after the engagement announcement at Kensington Palace. No matter what I did, they were still going to find a way to destroy me. Harry accused the royal family of not doing more to protect Meghan. In a lighter moment, Meghan describes the culture clash of meeting the Queen for the first time. We have medieval times, dinner and tournament. It was like that. Like, I curtsied as though I was like... How she is. Prince Harry made repeated references to Meghan's similarities with his mother, Princess Diana. She has the same compassion. She has the same empathy. She has the same confidence. She has this warmth about her. While the knives were out for the British press, more bombshells may come next week when the couple reveals what drove them to quit the royal family and the country. The series begins with a statement that members of the royal family declined to comment within the series. Well, we contacted the palace tonight and we were advised that no palace officials or members of the royal family were approached to comment on the content of the series. John? Charlie Daggett in London, thank you. Divers in Spain safely rescued a whale shark that was trapped in a fishing net this week. The animal got caught in traps meant to capture tuna fish. It took about four hours for divers to lift the net and release the whale shark. Whale sharks are the largest in the ocean and typically live in tropical waters. Next hour, Brittany Griner has been released by Russia in a prisoner swap with the U.S. But questions remain about another American still in Russian custody. Plus, the House passes two key bills, one on marriage, the other on defense. More on what's inside the measures. You're streaming CBS News primetime.